1964, SeaWorld San Diego would open to the public, a combination of aquarium and amusement park. This would eventually grow into the SeaWorld chain we all know today, but in 2013, a certain documentary covering SeaWorld's orcas would derail all their plans. The documentary Blackfish would focus on the life of Tilikum, a captive killer whale that has taken the lives of several people and underscores problems with the sea park industry. This film would cause protests against SeaWorld for their orcas and lose millions of dollars from both stock and lack of attendance. Fortunately, SeaWorld has bounced back to become more successful than ever. But how did a company go from steaming controversy to successful thrill park? This is how SeaWorld changed their identity. Our story begins with four grads from UCLA looking for a business opportunity. They envisioned an underwater restaurant, along with a marine life show. This proved to be impractical so the plans fell through, but the idea would be remolded into a marine life park. This would eventually turn out as SeaWorld San Diego. Open in 1964 on Mission Bay, this park would feature animal exhibits and shows such as dolphins, sea lions, and a handful of attractions on its 22 acre property. The park proved to be successful thanks to the family demographic interested in their sea creatures. It was time to expand. Their first foray into expansion would be in 1970 in Aurora, Ohio. This location was chosen because it was wedged between Detroit and Pittsburgh, an area containing the highest paid blue collar workers at the time, where the company saw a market opportunity for a place where families could take their kids. The park would be located adjacent to Geauga Lake and would operate for 31 years until 2001, until Six Flags bought out SeaWorld Ohio and merged it with Geauga Lake to create Six Flags Worlds of Adventure. A year after SeaWorld Ohio opened, they would be a part of a project to open Magic Mountain, aka the park that would eventually have the most roller coasters. However, SeaWorld's involvement wouldn't last long as they would sell their share in just a couple years later. The next expansion would come in 1973 in Orlando. Capitalizing the success of the Magic Kingdom, SeaWorld would build their next park nearby next to International Drive. SeaWorld Orlando would be so successful that the creators of SeaWorld would open America's first large-scale water park in Wenwad in 1977. Then in 1976, Hardcore Brace Jovanovich, or HBJ, would purchase the SeaWorld company. Twelve years later, they would make the decision to branch into San Antonio, Texas with a brand new park to open in 1988. Meanwhile, HBJ struggled to maintain the SeaWorld parks. Given how their main focus was on school books, the cost to keep the parks running was too expensive. They were looking to sell, and fortunately for them, they found a buyer that had experience with amusement parks. In 1959, Anheuser-Busch, the company that produces well-known beers such as Budweiser and Corona, would open a new brewery and bird garden called Busch Gardens Tampa. Located in Tampa, Florida, this place would be known at the time for beer tasting and its lush landscaping. The main attraction back then was the stairways to the stairs. This was an escalator that took you to the roof of the brewery to give amazing views of the park, almost like an observation ride. But the park technically wasn't really a park until 1965. That was the year when the company bought 70 acres of land for animal enclosures for guests to enjoy alongside the beer. This would be known as the Serengeti Plains. This, along with a loaded ground suspended monorail to coincide with the Serengeti Plains, would be Busch Gardens' new main attraction. This became so popular that guests from all over the state came to experience this new concept of a safari. The combination of animal exhibits and free beers made it a hit for adults to get their drink and the kids to get good views of the animals. Busch Gardens Tampa was so popular that it became the number one tourist attraction in 1968. Anheuser knew it was time to expand. Their first attempt was to bring Busch Gardens parks outside of Florida. This would result in three additional Busch Gardens parks. The first of these would be Busch Gardens Los Angeles in 1964, however that park closed in 1979 for a brewery expansion. Their next expansion would be Busch Gardens Houston. However, that park was a straight up failure as that only operated between 1971 and 1973 due to unprofitability. The final Busch Gardens parks would take a different path compared to the prior two parks. This would be Busch Gardens Williamsburg in 1979. The location near Williamsburg in Jamestown was chosen because of a deal between Anheuser-Busch and Cologne Williamsburg to build a new brewery, neighborhood, and amusement park. Unlike the previous two parks that were failures, Busch Gardens Williamsburg would be a huge success that saw an increase in tourism in the surrounding area. The next year, in 1976, Anheuser-Busch would dabble in roller coasters with rides from Aerodynamics and Schwarzkopf. The first was the now-defunct Python at the Tampa Park. While this ride was a run-of-the-mill corkscrew clone like the one at Michigan's Adventure, Python proved to be a hit for BTT's older audience. At the same time, the Williamsburg would open a pair of Schwarzkopf coasters a jumbo jet in Glissade, and a wildcat in Katska. 
neither of which were rather that impressive. However, the one to get a lot of attention would come in 1978 with BGW's Loch Ness Monster. This ride is an absolute icon, as this ride is located in a beautiful setting, but also features the only interlocking vertical loops. Bush would continue to invest into their parks, such as the Schwarzkopf Loop or Scorpion in 1980. That same year, Anheuser-Busch would spin off their theme parks into a separate division called Bush Entertainment. Bush Entertainment would call the shots for expansions, such as the Adventure Island Water Park and even join with Sesame Street to open Sesame Place in Pennsylvania. Then in September 1989, Bush Entertainment purchased the parks at HBJ. This deal gave Bush Gardens ownership of the SeaWorld parks, but also Cypress Gardens and Boardwalk and Baseball. However, the latter two parks wouldn't last long under Bush's ownership, as they would shut down Boardwalk and Baseball in 1990 and sell off Cypress Gardens in 1995. As for the remaining properties, they would go through a bit of a facelift. With SeaWorld now in the hands of Busch Gardens, both properties would see a new investment like never before. This first started with a pair of modern looping coasters for both the 1992 and 1993 season. The first was Drakenfire for Busch Gardens Williamsburg, however that was a major failure that only lasted 6 years, so that one really isn't that relevant. The other looper would be Kumba for Busch Gardens Tampa. Kumba would not only be a major success, but it would be one of the most important coasters of the 90s. This is because Kumba is one of the earliest roller coasters from BNM, which saw a major hit with Batman the Rat the year prior. The success of Kumba caused both companies to prosper and resulted in Bush Entertainment working with BNM for future projects. In 1995, Bush Entertainment would repeat what SeaWorld did with Magic Mountain and have part ownership of a brand new theme park this time going international to Spain with Poor Aventura. Built near the Mediterranean Sea, this park would be styled similar to the Busch Gardens parks. The most notable ride in the park is Dragon Con. Building off the success of Kumba, they would go back to BNM to build a Kumba-style ride, this time with the most inversions at the time with 8. But just like before, Bush's involvement wouldn't last long as they would soon sell their share of the park to Universal Studios. The next year, Bush Entertainment would continue buying BMs, this time with a trio of inverted coasters. The first would be Montu at the Tampa Park in 1996. Regarded as the best and most intense inverted coaster in the world, this coaster would ride off the heels of Kumba. The second would be Alpen Guides at the Williamsburg Park. This one would shatter the record for the tallest inverted coaster in the world. The final invert to be built was Great White for SeaWorld San Antonio, a clone of Batman the Ride just like the ones at the Six Flags Park. This moment would mark a change into SeaWorld parks to focus on thrill rides and not just animals. Then, SeaWorld Orlando would open Journey to Atlantis, the first mock rides water coaster. Seeing the success of the dark rides of Disney and Universal, combined with how hot and humid it gets in Florida, SeaWorld would get a ride that balances both dark ride and water ride. Journey to Atlantis would be so fitting that they would add similar rides to San Antonio in 2007, and San Diego would mark this as their first roller coaster in 2004. Continuing the coaster craze, SeaWorld San Antonio would add Steel Eel, a Morgan Mini Hyper similar to rides twice as tall such as Mamba Worlds of Fun. Busch Gardens Table would add Gwazi, Williamsburg would get the first BNM Hyper in Apollo's Chariot, and kicking off the new millennium would be Kraken for the Orlando Park. The wheels were in motion start bringing in more to these parks than just animals and were appealing to most guests that were brought in from multi-million dollar editions. This would be closer to that goal with the introduction of Aquatica, aka SeaWorld's own branded water park following the Busch Gardens water parks. Then in 2009, the Belgian-based company InBev would purchase all of Anheuser-Busch, which included all of Busch's theme park division. Later that year, InBev would sell all the theme parks to the Blackstone Group, which renamed it Busch Entertainment as SeaWorld Parks. Despite this, SeaWorld were still adding additions to at their parks, such as B&M dive coasters for their Busch Gardens parks, then added a B&M flyer to SeaWorld Orlando in 2009, and a mock multi-launch for San Diego in 2012, both called Manta. While all of these new rides would be nice additions to these parks, their main attraction was the one that they were known for, Shamu, but in 2013, that all changed. A whale has eaten one of the trainers. We both herded them in, and they could just pick out the young ones. We store these whales in what we call a module, which was 20 feet across and 30 feet deep, and the lights were all turned out. Probably led to what I think is a psychosis. All whales in captivity are all psychologically traumatized. Blackfish caught the attention of the country and pop culture. 
Produced by both CNN and Mongolia Pictures, this documentary focused on the criticism of SeaWorld's treatment of their orcas in captivity. The film stayed in theaters for 14 weeks and earned more than $2 million. This film that brought to light on SeaWorld was partly due to a killer whale killing one of its performers in 2010. Several major musical acts canceled their concerts at the SeaWorld and Busch Gardens parks in 2014. SeaWorld fought back against the accusations of the film, stating it was inaccurate and misleading, pointing out that SeaWorld also works to rehabilitate animals and return them to the wild every year and is committed to conservation and scientific research. There was even a page on their website dedicated to debunking the claims made in the film. Despite their efforts to help the animals in their environment, they couldn't deny the fact that they are capturing and keeping the orcas captive. SeaWorld knew that this would be a major public relations nightmare, and they were right. Following the film's release, SeaWorld's profits went into a steep decline and its share values plummeted. By the end of 2014, SeaWorld stock took a 50% nosedive. This was partly driven by legislations passed by Congress to update regulations for captive orcas and other marine life mammals. This legislation was set off because of blackfish. A bill was also introduced in California to ban orcas shows at SeaWorld San Diego, a direct threat to the livelihood of the San Diego Park. By August 2015, SeaWorld announced an 84% drop in the second quarter of 2015, from $37.4 million to $5.8 million. Total income was down 3% from 2014 to 2015. Visitor numbers fell by 100,000 from 6.58 million to 6.48 million. And then in 2014, SeaWorld CEO would resign. Attendance, revenue, income, and the company's share price were all down. Something have to give, and in November 2015, SeaWorld announced that its killer whale show would end. The final performance would take place in January of 2017. On March 17, 2016, SeaWorld announced it would stop breeding orcas and begin phasing out all live performances using orcas. They rethemed their Shamu Express Kitty Coaster to Super Grover's Boxcar Derby, and the Shamu Emporium was rebranded as the SeaWorld Store. SeaWorld San Diego would also replace both Shamu Stadium and Dining with Shamu with Orca Counter and Dining with Orca. SeaWorld was facing an identity crisis and needed a new direction. Luckily, they would find a way of change. With SeaWorld swimming in losses, they needed a solid foundation to get back up. Enter CEO Joel Manby, the former CEO of Hershen Entertainment. Having experienced running parks such as Dollywood, he basically wanted to enact plans to transform SeaWorld into full-fledged resorts, tying together entertainment, hospitality, and retail. Basically, think Disney and Universal. But there is also another appointment. Anthony Esparza, as the chief creative officer who created the Deep Blue Creative Unit to dream up new ideas for their parks. This included new festivals, parades, and finding a bigger role for the Sesame Street IP in their parks. But the big change would be the shift away from animals and steer more into thrill-based attractions. This would begin to occur in 2016 with the introduction of Mako at SeaWorld Orlando. Going back to B&M for a true favorite, this began a significant change for these parks. Following the addition of Mako, SeaWorld Orlando would add virtual reality headsets to their floorless coaster Kraken, creating the Kraken Unleashed experience for the 2017 season. The San Antonio Park would receive their first coaster in a decade, the Intamin Launch Coaster, Wave Breaker, the Rescue Coaster. SeaWorld has previously worked with Intamin for both Cheetah Hunt and Falcons Ferry for Busch Gardens Tampa. However, this coaster marked a new working relationship with Intamin to build newer and better rides from them. Both Orlando and San Diego received the Electric Ocean End of Night Show. This was the start of a movement that would catch everyone's attention in the industry. The SeaWorld parks focused little to nothing on rides prior to the Anheuser-Busch acquisition in 1989, but it would now be a major priority for the company. This strategy also extended to the Busch Gardens parks, which were also negatively affected by the downfall of their sister parks. Busch Gardens Tampa would receive the mock spinning coaster Curl Busch Curse in 2016, and Williamsburg got the GCI Family Coaster Invader for 2017. For the 2018 season, San Diego got the premier ride Skyrocket 2, Electric Eel, and Orlando received the Infinity Falls Rapids ride with the world's biggest rapids drop. This new strategy also extended into the Sesame Street IP. This would be noted with a Gravity Group family wooden coaster for Sesame Place in Pennsylvania, Oscar's Wacky Taxi. In 2019, San Diego got the Skyline Attractions Skywarp Horizon Tidal Twister. Even when this ride immediately was a disaster, it still added a nice touch to the park. Busch Gardens got a clone of Electric Eel with Tigress, and Busch Gardens Williamsburg received the SNS Scream and Swing and Finnegan's Flyers. But it gets really crazy for the 2020 season. All five of their major parks got a new coaster planned for that year. SeaWorld Orlando would get Icebreaker, a premier ride's multi-launch that would cater to both the thrill seekers as well as the newcomers. San Antonio, meanwhile, would receive 
received the GCI Wind Coaster Texas Stingray. This would be the evolved version of the old Guazi ride, with a more refined layout, smoother ride, and more airtime. See what San Diego was the last to get a B&M, the mini dive coaster Emperor. This coaster would be different from the other American B&M dives as its smaller size make it more focused on its layout similar to the European ones. Busch Gardens Williamsburg makes a splash with Pantheon, an intimate blitz coaster complete with forwards and backwards moments and a high speed switch track. This intimate creation completes BGW's ride lineup as this fills in a shoe for their standout attraction. Finally, Busch Gardens Tampa gets the big shotgun of the group with the RMC conversion of Guazi with the new name, Iron Guazi. If you want to know what makes this ride special or how this happened, I recommend checking out this video I made about the history of the original Guazi. These new rides meant that SeaWorld was supposed to have a great 2020 year. But notice how I said supposed to. But before we can get to that, we first have to discuss some behind the scenes drama. Even though it seemed like SeaWorld as a company has been rebouncing back, behind the scenes came some worrying moves. First of all, both Mambi and Esparza would step down from SeaWorld in 2018, three years after being appointed. The company appointed Carnival Cruise Chief Operating Officer Gus Antarka as SeaWorld CEO in February 2019. However, SeaWorld CEO John Riley stepped down and eventually left the company one month later. That same year, SeaWorld would get involved in a class action lawsuit revolving around their season passes. Apparently, the lawsuit was filed against them because of their automatic renewal after passing the original expiration date. This was eventually settled for $11.5 million. In May 2019, Zhong Hong Group defaulted on its loans which were secured by SeaWorld's common stock. The company turned its shares over to its lenders. Thus, SeaWorld terminated its agreements for park development with the group. A lot of the ownership went to Hillpath Capital, who already had stake in SeaWorld starting in 2015. Hillpath's share of the company after the purchase was a controlling stake of 34.5%. SeaWorld agreed to have three Hillpath director nominees join its board. After seven months in the post, CEO Gus Antorka resigned on September 16, 2019. That same day, its Orlando call center was laid off and replaced by an outsourcing company. The board hired Sergio D. Rivera, previously president and CEO of ILG's Inc.'s vacation ownership business, as a replacement in November 2019. On April 6, 2020, Rivera resigned as CEO with Chief Financial Officer Mark Swanson appointed as interim CEO. So why did all these management changes happen within a five-year window? Apparently, it was due to a bad relationship with the board of directors. More specifically, Scott Ross, the founder and management partner of Hillpath Capital, who had been gaining more and more influence on SeaWorld since 2015. And in July 2019, Scott Ross became the chairman of the board. The majority of CEOs and higher ups' resignation was because of disagreements with the board. Basically, the two had conflicting opinions on how to run SeaWorld and their parks properly without turning them into La Ronde. Sorry, Six Flags, but excluding Fiesta Texas, you don't know how to run a proper park. Scott Ross was calling the shots here, or even micromanaging the company, and this didn't sit well with the CEOs. Remember Scott Ross and Hillpath Capital, as he was the driving force of the past and future for SeaWorld. Not too long after Ross was appointed chairman, the company was slashing costs at the expense of the company's morale. SeaWorld's corporate financial reports were successful in September 2019, but then they turned around and fired 100 call center workers in Orlando in order to outsource their jobs to other countries. Four months later, they outsourced their midway games to a British company, and those employees had to reapply with their new employer or else get a severance package and look for work elsewhere. These were questionable moves, but they were looking forward to a massive year with major ride openings. So did SeaWorld get a return they were looking for? <sighs> Let's address the suckage that was 2020. In late 2019 in Wuhan, China, several patients began showing symptoms for a new virus called COVID-19. Little did anyone knew at the time that this new variant of the coronavirus would be a major worldwide disaster. In no time at all, several people around the world were getting infected by this virus. This is because after a person is infected with COVID, they wouldn't show any signs for two weeks before getting sick. And in those two weeks, they are very contagious and spread easily from person to person. Even worse, since this was a brand new variant of a virus, there was no vaccine at the time to prevent such a spread. The cause of this is speculated that the disease mutated and crossed species from a bat to a human. By February 2020, COVID-19 was declared a worldwide health emergency as a pandemic. By March of 2020, all of the world was in lockdown in an attempt to slow down the virus. This was detrimental for literally everyone alive. For some, they have suffered the loss of their loved ones. For others, they ended up losing their jobs and risk living on the streets. For businesses and owners, not having any money coming in meant they ran the risk of bankruptcy. 
This is especially the case for SeaWorld and the entire tourist industry, as they rely on thousands of guests each day to make their money. But they can't do that in this circumstances because in that environment, COVID-19 can spread much more easily than in a Burger King. This shutdown around the world will range between a few months to a whole year depending on where the location was. Some businesses and amusement parks were barely able to open by August like the Florida parks. This pandemic would show the terrible financial state that SeaWorld was in. The first sign that SeaWorld was in deep trouble was when they furloughed 90% of their workforce just two weeks after the shutdown. No pay, no benefits. This was while Universal and Disney were still committed to paying their staff. The next month, their seven executives took a 7% pay cut, but were given $7 million in stock rewards for the next two years if they stay committed to the company through 2022. But the striking news story to come out of SeaWorld came in June. Despite the company repeating over and over again that they have enough cash to get through the end of 2021, they reported not paying their contractors. Just in Orlando, 56 liens were filed for a total of $16 million. And it was a similar story down in Tampa and San Diego. RMC was looking for 3.5 of the $9 million they owed for Iron Wazi. Premier Rides was short 2.7 of the $8.2 million for Icebreaker. Balfour Beatty Construction filed two liens for $6.1 million owed for their Orlando. Orlando projects at both SeaWorld Orlando and Aquatica Orlando. Just for reference, in 2019, only 10 liens were filed for a total of $1 million. Liens are just a claim on the property to ensure the debt is paid. It's not necessarily a legal challenge. But things were a little more serious in California, where a level 10 construction accused SeaWorld of breaching their contract of pay, owing 3.3 of the $11 million owed for Emperor. This was all happening as the chain was borrowing extra money to increase its cash reserve, exceeding $400 million by the end of April and claiming 18 months of cash cushion. So why was SeaWorld stiffing their contractors? A theory that could explain these actions was the company contemplating bankruptcy. Sounds familiar? X2. If you look at this from the standpoint of Scott Ross and Hillpath Capital, they became heavily involved in SeaWorld in 2015. Just a year later, SeaWorld struck a deal with Foray Entertainment to open SeaWorld Abu Dhabi in 2022 across the street from Ferrari World. In 2017, SeaWorld's new investors sought to expand into China, but that fell through when they lost the investment from the company that owed the land where the park was going to go. Despite this blow, they were full speed ahead on their new strategy to rebuild their brand on thrill rides and other attractions that have nothing to do with marine animals. But with COVID setting park back years, or even decades, Scott Ross and Hillpath Capital may be looking at the long run road back to profitability and want to bail out now to get the best possible return on investment. The fact that SeaWorld also wanted to sell some animals also supported this theory. The fewer the animals, the lower the set cost equals more appeal to the parks would be to buyers. Moreover, if the company did go into bankruptcy, it would make it easier to break up the chain and sell to different buyers. This theory made it seem like bankruptcy is a choice. Another likely reason for them declaring bankruptcy is their cash to debt ratio, which is the company's cash flow from operations compared to its total debt. A higher ratio indicates a company's ability to pay off their debt. Companies often try to shoot for about 66%. SeaWorld checks in at a low 18%. Their balance sheet was over leveraged, meaning they took on too much debt. It's not uncommon for parks to be over leveraged, but usually can show lenders how much they're growing and refinance their debt. With a bad economy, limited capacity, and operating with negative margins, they're forced to raise additional debt at higher interest rates and hope for a quick recovery that's not guaranteed. They raised $500 million in secure notes back in July 2020, but owe 9.5% interest on them. SeaWorld is burning $20 to $25 million per month just to recover the loss. They only had 98 operating days in the second quarter in 2020, compared to the 900 operating days chain-wide. Those 98 days brought 300,000 guests falling short of the 2019 numbers by 6.2 million guests. The first half of 2019 saw $171.6 billion in revenue, and during 2020, in the same time frame, they suffered a net loss of $187.6 million. Their stock is recovering after taking a big hit right after the shutdown, but it is creeping back up. As you can see, SeaWorld is losing tons of cash in a year. And that doesn't even include the millions in severance packages for the employees that had to permanently let go. The bottom line is that they have a high debt load, limited capacity of their parks, and they continue to bleed cash. This is a recipe for bankruptcy. Luckily, they barely made it through without having to go with bankruptcy but they still had a long ways to go. 2021 does not get much better as they'd still suffer from net loss and they would encounter another issue, staffing. With all those jobs lost and businesses cutting down staff, it leaves them with not enough employees. This results in overworked and underpaid staff who just wants to go home. 
the bigger issue is that this causes businesses to not run properly. This explains why there is an unusual amount of accidents happening in 2021. Pair that with the fact that there's not enough cash and you have a recipe for a bad experience. I heard reports that year that SeaWorld and Busch Gardens parks were getting dirtier, operations still suck, ride closures becoming more frequent, etc. Plus, since we were still in a pandemic at the time, the majority of the public did not want to visit their amusement parks in fear of catching COVID. But the issues were the new for 2020 rides, or sorry, 2021, actually scratch that, 2022. Yeah, those rides got delayed numerous times. Now that by itself isn't an issue, rides get delayed all the time. However here, there was a lack of transparency on when these rides would open, this made everyone frustrated frustrated on not knowing when they would open. One effect from this lack of transparency is that a lot of people sort of forgot about these new rides and instead focus on other new stuff added that year like Ride to Happiness. The one ride that didn't have these issues was Texas Stingray. This is due to how fast GCI got the thing built and tested and it actually opened just 3 weeks before the shutdown. Fortunately, SeaWorld would soon have a great 2022. After a couple rocky years, SeaWorld would get the year they deserve with the new additions. The first was SeaWorld Orlando's Icebreaker. Icebreaker would be a nice fit for the Orlando park as it gives them a nice launch coaster for the family demo. Actually, forget the whole family aspect of Icebreaker. That's because the park had to raise the height requirement to 54 inches due to the annoying comfort collars. Look at you, Tigress. Luckily, they would remove the comfort collars, bringing it back to 48 inches, so it's all good now. Either way, Icebreaker would be the sleeper hit of that year with its surprising airtime. The next new opening for Seal was the one that everyone was waiting for. The long-awaited Iron Gwazi for Busch Gardens Tampa. Not only was Iron Gwazi such an incredible ride, but it was also among the best roller coasters in the world. It even won Best New Ride of 2022 at the Golden Ticket Awards later that year. These two Florida rides were important because of the rise in competition in Florida. Universal Studios was the big one here ever since Harry Potter opened in 2010. Since then, Universal has grown the Orlando Resort into a top-tier destination. With additions like Diagon Alley, Hagrid's, Velocicoaster, and the upcoming Epic Universe theme park with Nintendo and a mock multi-launch to bolster that claim. Disney, meanwhile, was building new rides and Vacomas to keep up with Universal. With additions like Pandora, Galaxy's Edge, Cosmic Rerun, and Tron to keep up, even if some of the new additions have been mediocre at best. Anyway, back to SeaWorld, just one day after Iron Gwazi opened, San Diego debuted Emperor. This B&M mini dive coaster was a coaster that SeaWorld San Diego needed. Emperor would be the new marquee attraction for San Diego. Busch Gardens Williamsburg would be the last to debut their delayed ride, Pantheon. This intimate multi-launch became Williamsburg's new signature ride, as this offers a wide variety of forces. SeaWorld San Antonio would even get in the action with their new SNS Scream and Swing, Tidal Surge. This flat ride fills in a gap that all SeaWorld parks have an issue with, and that's the lack of flat rides. Not to mention, this is the tallest of its kind, coming in at 135 feet, or for my non-Americans out there, 41 meters tall. Finally, SeaWorld would open a brand new theme park in Sesame Place San Diego. The former Aquatica San Diego was rebranded into a new Sesame Place park. SeaWorld's 2022 season proved to be a major success. With more people than ever wanting to come back combined with all these new best rides, attendance and revenue jumped big time. They welcomed 21.9 million guests in 2022, up 8.6% from 2021. Price increases and surcharges at the park helped SeaWorld push their average guest spending, even if it did suck for the average consumer, to $78.91, up 5.7% in 2021 and 27.7% from 2019. As a result, the company's EBITDA of $728.2 million, up 10% from 2021 and up 59.4% from 2019. This new wave of success would push SeaWorld to repeat again for the 2023 season, with new rides for every major park. Busch Gardens Tampa would open first with an SNS Scream and Swing, Serengeti Flyers. Like SeaWorld San Antonio, Serengeti Flyers would fill a big gap for Tampa with a new flat ride. Next would be Busch Gardens Williamsburg with Dark Coaster. This intimate straddle coaster had shoes to fill given it's in a building that occupied the former curse of Dark Castle Dark Ride. See what Orlando got Pipeline the Surf Coaster. Initially when this coaster was revealed, everyone was baffled on why they would revise the stand-up coaster as those are just as hated as the Vacoma SLCs. Especially if you're a dude. But when reviews came out, the ride surprised many for the bouncing features on the train, making the ride experience much more comfortable. See what San Diego would also receive an intimate straddle coaster. 
Arctic Rescue. This is similar to Manta in the same park, but the difference is the straddle seating. This makes it different enough to fit within its family audience. Finally, see what San Antonio is getting Catapult Falls. As of right now, the ride has yet to open as this is a prototype Intamin Log Flume, featuring both a launch and the world's steepest drop on a log flume. If that isn't enough, SeaWorld recently opened the brand new SeaWorld Abu Dhabi after being delayed a year. Having more focus on animals, this indoor theme park features some notable attractions such as the Intamin Multi-Launch Coaster Manta. A mini Velocicoaster is a good ride at this park. As for the writing of this video, this is where we are today. But SeaWorld is always evolving and constantly improving. They're always adding new stuff in the future. SeaWorld Orlando had plans leaked to add a prototype BM multi launch. Busch Gardens Williamsburg followed Permis to build a new 220 foot, 67 meter attraction on the old Drakenfire land. And Busch Gardens Tampa announced the closing of Sand Serpent in June to be replaced with better attractions. Whatever the case, I hope to see SeaWorld succeed with new rides for the foreseeable future. And hopefully, they don't have to go through another Blackfish again. So that is the history of the SeaWorld chain. I hope you enjoyed this video that I put together. If you liked this video, which if you watched to the end, it means you did, you could help out by giving a like. This took up a lot of time, so I would really appreciate it. Also, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications. It only takes 5 seconds to do, and that motivates me to make more content like this in the future. We have more content like this lined up, so you don't want to miss that. This is the Coaster Flood, riding out.